thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's our declaration this morning that only you satisfy. There's a lot of things that are out there, Lord, right now, but we thank you that you satisfy. I love the songs that uh, Eric and the team have picked. The first one was Taste and See. <laughs> Talking about hunger. Anybody ever have a great meal? I won't even mention the food because we all have different tastes. It could be Mexican. It could be steak. It could be maybe it could be a Twinkie. They make, do they make those still? Yeah, they're, they've been around for 60 years. <laughs> but just... There's something about acknowledging His presence when you're in it. There's something that you saying, Lord, I acknowledge your presence right here is a fulfillment. It's a type and shadow of the declaration that the prophet in Psalm says, taste and see. Trying to use natural language to describe the atmosphere, the presence of God that is uniquely different when it's not there. And yet he's ever present. I've been married 40 years to this gal named Suzanne. Hoo hoo. And it, it reminds me of the awareness that I have all the time that I'm married. So even when she's not in the room, I'm aware that that's a fact and that it is a, a reality in my life. So I don't drive around thinking something else. I'm aware of that relationship. I acknowledge it. But then there's those times when she walks in the room and my heart skips a beat and it's like, are you kidding me? I get to do life with this girl and she surprises me all the time with how she thinks and how she sees things. And I'm thinking, if that's true for me concerning her, how much more true is it with my relationship with God? and how fresh he is right now, today, that I, I walk with an awareness that he lives and dwells in me. I say it, I'm, I'm saying it more than I have in a while. It's, I'm a new creature. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. On the inside, Jesus lives and dwells in me. John 17, there is, you can't get a piece of paper in between him and me. And then yet when he comes into the room, like, like right now, he's in the room. And you can feel his, the fragrance that he carries. He's here. And, he, and he's not looking for anything in you that's not right. It's so fresh. It's like, just the awareness. I, I, I'm having a hard time finding words because it's so tangible to me right now that even when I hold my hands up, I can feel, I can feel his presence on my hands. I can feel it. It's like, and then I had this thought. This is, this is part of your assignment. It's, it can be this afternoon, even when you leave here. But I thought of when we all get busy during the week, first thing Monday morning, you know, life kind of sets in. Going to work, taking kids to school, doing the things that we do to get where we need to go. But maybe sitting in your car or gals if you're at the kitchen sink, it's taken three minutes. <laughs> Just stop. And say, Lord, I acknowledge your presence here right now. Come Holy Spirit. 
And you don't have to say anything more. Just pay attention. You might get a whiff of heaven. You might sense the fragrance of heaven. People have used different words to describe it. Smelt like a rose garden instantly in the room when you know everything around you has another smell. And yet heaven has invaded your space for a few moments. And it's learning to just cultivate those times of intimacy with him. And I think we can all do three minutes. It may feel like an eternity because we're not used to it, but it's, it's training ourselves to practice the presence, practice Him being tangibly there and acknowledging it. There's something about acknowledging it when He does that. It's something that happens when you and I say with our mouth, this is what's going on, and I want to acknowledge that you're here and you're very, very present here right now in my life. I wrote down a couple of things during worship. This is, this service is so different from the first one. I'm going to encourage you with this, too, that when you come to services, ask God what he's doing in the room. This is what I sense, is that he's inviting all of us into another level of intimacy with him, that we're having conversation all the time. But it, it starts with intentionality. It starts with... So for me, when I come in, I'm asking, even when I'm not ministering, Lord, what are you doing in the service? What, what's going on? What's the activity of heaven in here? Would you show me? And sometimes I see something, and I don't see. So let me rephrase that. I think this might apply to some. I, I sense something going on, and I might have a picture more in my heart or it's, it's not something that on a screen or anything that way I just have a sense and so I might use the words that I see but it's not seen like what I see with my eyes and there's probably a lot of us that way and then I, I look at the songs what is the Holy Spirit using in the songs that he's given to the team to, to Eric to lead us into because he's going after something with the words in the song. Not everything in the song may speak to you, but there's something going on. So for me, it was shame is undone. Shame is undone. Break our walls down. So I feel like, I sense... It's hard to describe. You just have, you kind of go, mm, what, what are you doing? Okay, you, what's with shame? How do you deal with shame in a group of X number of people? And it's like, this is what I'm going to pray, a real simple prayer. That if your heart registered the word shame, I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything. But I'm going to pray a prayer that that word that has been sung is still working in the room and breaking shame off of you for anything and everything you've ever thought that you've done and can't even remember that you've done, that you've been ashamed of. The devil has tormented you with occasional thoughts of your unworthiness, your Let's say regret of things that you've done. We're pulling the walls down. The only thing I need from you is a yes and amen when I pray. Amen? All right, here we go. Father, I thank you that that word has been released through the team, the music team, the worship team. 
Shame is broken over everyone. Those that are listening online, no matter where you're at on the planet, shame is broken off of you in Jesus' name. Walls are coming down. They're breaking down. And in Jesus' name, I thank you for the oil and the wine of your spirit being poured out on them, filling every crack, every crevice of anything that's ever been there before so that there is a, I want to say, that's that highway of holiness that's smooth and easy for them to walk in their days that are ahead of them. In Jesus' name. And if you can agree, just say amen. Amen. So part of that three minutes is, I'm, I'm going back to three minutes in the car or wherever. I, I'm glad I write stuff down because otherwise I just would have kept going. But it's fill me up and running over. Fill me up to running over. So there's a, there's a bottle of water here. And if I grabbed another bottle of water and I poured it in till it was full, that's just full. But when we said, fill me up to overflowing, I would keep pouring. I would just keep pouring. That's what the kingdom of heaven is all about in your life and my life. It's the king has poured out on your life and my life to overflowing. Part of the three minutes is acknowledging that. Because that's true concerning you. And it has nothing to do with what you have done is everything to do with what he has already done and then all the other stuff falls off when we acknowledge that Oop. give him three minutes and then the last part of it the song we sang can you hear it can you hear it it's the sound of heaven touching earth so our prayer is, Father, in Matthew 6, on earth as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Now I start crying, my nose runs. Hallelujah. Amen. So, Father, we just have ears to hear the voice of your spirit. Thank you for the invitation for intimacy. Thank you that you're taking us deeper, wider, and farther, farther than what we can think, dream, or imagine. I'm reminded of in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet saw himself standing in water that was ankle deep. But he didn't stay there and wasn't happy with just ankle deep water in his life. I thank you that you're calling us, Father, from ankle deep to knee deep. And as we continue to move, it goes from knee deep to waist deep. And as we go from waist deep, we go to the middle of our chest and we still hear, we still hear your voice saying, come out here, come out here, come out out here water over your head water over your head this is the place that you've been crying out for you want the more you got to get out where the water is over your head yeah there's safety on the shore but you're not called to live on the shore you're called to live in the deep you're called to live where the freshness of his voice is yours every day he calls Unto you, as this, I, uh, wherever it is, it's deep calls unto deep. He's already released a word in his word concerning you that you're called to be in the deep place. That's your home. Water over your head. Total dependence on him. God, if you don't show up, I'm not going to make it. And the worst thing is, if I don't make it, he's still there. <laughs> come on but he's always there so father I thank you for what you've done already we've had church if we quit now we could go home it's all good Lord I, I just uh, I want to 
do this too. I speak blessings on the worship team. The worship team. The worship team was good when I was here in August a year ago. It's off the charts. And I thank you that the chart is continuing to be rewritten over all these guys and gals. Father, I thank you that your voice has also gone out to those that are called and anointed and appointed to be in this place called Lighthouse Christian Church. I thank you that your voice is calling them to find their place of habitation and dwelling. It may be for a season, it might be a a long run. I see this place, Lord, as a place that sends people to the four corners of the earth without regret. And every person that gets sent out, you bring in others for them to be healed and made whole in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, team. Glory to God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Well, that was fun. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I am going to start at the beginning with this that I did in the other service. That may be the only resemblance that we have of the 830 service is I felt like, you know, in asking the Lord about the service is if you have pain in your body right now, uh, I'm not going to ask you to stand up, not going to raise your hands, but I want you to think about that pain that's going on. I don't care where it is. And on a scale of 1 to 10, mentally, you know, if it's a 5, you go, it's a 5. If you need to write it down, write it down. Because we're going to talk about it at the end of the service. Okay? So if you have pain in your body on a scale of 1 to 10, it's okay to acknowledge that it's there because it is. And be truthful. You know, if it's an 8 or you're about ready to scream because it's higher than that, um, that's okay too because it's going to change. I'll say, I I will say that and then we'll go from there at the end of the service. Okay. I felt like James chapter 1, starting a little bit different than before, but um, this was the main text that I felt like I am to walk through with you, and uh, I'll get there. I still have a paper Bible. <laughs> there was a time in my life when I, I, I struggled with those that just use electronics, but then the last five years I've been around a bunch of young people that are between 18 and 25 or so, and that's the only thing they carry is an electronic Bible. Right here. And then I asked the question, can you take notes? Well, yeah, there's a note app in my phone. Then they use both hands. I'm still this guy. I started cheating, though, because there's also a voice memo on here that I found. And it's like when I'm driving, it's like I had this thought. Yeah, yeah record, which sometimes scares my wife because I'm still looking at my phone when I'm driving, but anyway, I repent. I'm really working on that. But uh, for me, it doesn't matter just as long as you're reading or listening to the Word because I want to talk to you about how important the Word of God is to us in our lives. Uh, James. James was one of those books that a lot of... uh, We'll say scholars didn't want to put in our Bibles. They felt like it contradicted some things that Paul said about it in Romans and some other places about the grace of God. Uh, I'm glad James made it in. I feel like that was definitely God, of course, because uh, he's, he's like this no-nonsense. This is the way it is. So he starts off his letter with, uh, count it all joy when you're getting the tar beat out of you. And you feel like you're drowning in a cesspool of whatever. 
He's, that's how he starts. It's like, dude, I don't want to count it all joy. You know, get behind me. <laughs> I want to be in, you know, this mopey corner somewhere licking my wounds or whatever. He says, no. He says, you need to know that the testing of your faith is producing something in you that's far worth more than anything you can think, dream, or imagine. So it's, hey, Wally and Judy, that's my in-laws, not my outlaws, my in-laws. I love them. They're incredible uh, believers. Uh, my my father-in-law told me, he says, I can't believe that anybody, I don't know if you remember this, Wally, but you... You told me that you can't believe that anybody, that God would lead anybody to live north of the Florida, Georgia border and didn't believe in divine healing. <laughs> this is before I married Suzanne. That's what he said to me. Never forgotten it. Actually, I live in California, so it's, it's a test of faith. But anyway, moving right along. Interesting place. And we are saying that... Uh, just so that you know, sometimes when God puts you in a place that you feel like doesn't have the fragrance of heaven, you're there because you have the fragrance of heaven. So bring it. That was free, not part of the message. Anyway, you kind of get the feel for James. And uh, he's kind of hard-hitting, no nonsense. But I wanted to pick up in verse number 21 through basically 25. 21 through 25. I gave the audio guys more verses, and I think after the last service, it's like I, I never looked at the other. I looked at Romans 12, uh, verse 2, but I didn't look at the other two. Um, I just can't seem to get some places. I have, a, I have this notepad with 19 different words that we could look at in the Greek. I kid you not. I, I, and Martita would laugh. Yes, that's, that is me, and I'm probably only going to get, hopefully, to two. <laughs> Maybe next message, but anyway. I, I will make reference to this, Romans 12, verse 2. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you can approve what is the good will and good, perfect will of God. What is it? Good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And I'm kind of going through this walk with the Lord right now that when I, in my uh, quiet time in reading, I read in the mornings, I get up early, just like to read. And it's like every verse I read, words are jumping off the page. But I don't want to say, Lord, don't show me anything. Because I prayed for years, show me stuff. So now he's showing me stuff. And the, the question came in Romans 12 was, and I heard this from another mentor, a father in the faith for me, pointed out, when you read that, it doesn't say what to renew your mind with. We kind of read it into the text, right? It, which is okay. We read things in. I, I get it. Because it doesn't say be renewed in, the, in, in your mind with the Word of God. The Word of God is not in there. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But there are other places all over the Bible that talk to us about it being the Word of God. So this is, this is the thought is, this is, how this is how this works for you and I in our relationship with the Lord, that when you're reading your Bible and you have a thought as you're reading, pay attention to it and go ahead and go on a journey with him there because you're probably going to have another verse pop up and then maybe another verse. That's him leading you on a journey of discovery. He's wanting to show you something, and it may upset you because you don't get your devotion done. Some of us are wired that way, aren't we? I've got to read this chapter. It's part of my yearly devotion. I've got to read one testament, Old Testament, New Testament, one proverb, one psalm, and it's like you're throwing this all out of whack, which is kind of like, it's like being married. 
where he says, we're, we're not having that conversation. We're going over here. This is Suzanne saying, we're not doing that now. I forgot to tell you. We're going over here. And over 40 years, I've learned to just go, yes, ma'am. That's, here we go. So that's, I'm living long and prospering, <laughs> as Spock would say. So anyway, verse 21, therefore putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does." There's so many things in here, but what I want to maybe land on is is proving myself a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Most of us have been taught, if we've been born again for any length of time, it's probably a message on the the word word, W-O-R-D. What is it in the Greek? And then you discover that there are other words that are in the Greek that use that same word as word or similar statements. And so I'll land on to the word logos is what James uses right here. So when I read it, I'm going, I need to receive the logos. So what is the logos? Well, to make it really, really simple, it's, it's the it's a, a written set of things or principles that are, let's say, written out. They could be sayings. Uh, they could be statements. Luke loves the word, uh, not logos, but he loves the word uh, rhema. Um, and I've just got ahead of myself. So let me back up, take two steps back, run the tape back. Okay, logos. So logos is... It would be like me coming up with a list of things. I'll use my kids. A list of things for my kids to do as they were growing up and they were training them to be humans in life and not expect everything handed to them. But you have chores to do. You know, that dreaded word. I have chores. I have to clean my room and those types of things. But it's usually a list that we give our kids. Let's say it's five to ten things. This is what you are responsible for. So you're to take out the trash. You're to clean your bathrooms. Pick up the towels in the bathroom floor. You don't get out of the bathtub or the shower and throw stuff and walk out and leave stuff. This is the list. One of the things on the list I think will touch the hearts of a a lot of people is things left in the sink after someone eats. It's usually moms. Uh, Husbands, men, we're notorious. We've used it. We're done. It's in the sink. Catch you later. If not, I'll buy paper plates and paper cups and stuff like that later. Uh, That is a true story. My roommate and I, when I first moved out of my parents' house, we used that a lot. We, got, we never washed the dishes. There was stuff piled up. So we went out and bought Chinette paper plates and the whole nine yards and just started throwing stuff away. It's terrible. Fast forward. Now we're married. I got kids. My wife refuses to live there. So they have a list. Put your stuff in the dishwasher, but rinse it out. Certain criteria. Well, then after a season, which is usually not long, it could be a week, because it depends on mom and where she's at. I'm I'm using that in a generic term. It can be the husband where the wife doesn't, all that stuff. So I'm kind of writing a novel here. You've got to give me some latitude when I'm writing as to who the characters are. You insert yourself in one of those places. So my wife, after a, a couple days... Usually she'll let it build, and then 
we move away from the Logos, the written word, to a rhema. A rhema word comes that is from the kitchen. Who put this in here? And of course, it touches everybody in the room because it's not just one cup, it's several cups. So everybody kind of jumps up at the living voice. It's taken the Logos, what has been written and what has been declared you are to do, that it's in the sink. Now I'm requiring you to get up and come and act on the Logos that I've given you. So now here we are with that going on is we've heard the living word. It even came to a point, I'm telling on my wife, where she made an eight and a half by 11. And um, what do you call it when you put that plastic over it? Laminated it. I kid you not. It was in the sink. <laughs> because my kids and myself were not responding even to the rhema. So now she has gone to yelling with a eight and a half by 11 in the sink because you would have to put the cup on that laminated piece of paper looking at you. And I could hear her in that piece of paper. <laughs> Some of you have read your Bible the same way, right? You're reading it and you're going, oh, oh, you're, I'm supposed to do that with them uh, Lord, can we pray for something else? It's usually in, in forgiveness and some things that way and dealing with people that we're in relationship with. So you, you get the feeling for Logos and Rhema. But James is saying, you need to receive the Logos. The Logos has this incredible important part in our life that we need to bring it in because he starts in verse 21. Therefore... I need to put aside, put off from me filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. If you have a King James, it says superfluity of naughtiness. <laughs> I never knew for years what that meant. But it means wickedness and filthiness. So James is talking about maybe things that have gotten attached to our lives that we need to intentionally put off in our behavior, probably in our speech, and act differently. So what we do is he gives me a formula. So I need to receive with humility the Logos. So now I'm talking about the posture of my heart. What is going on in my heart when I read the Logos and I'm offended or hurt or even angry? at a particular passage that I don't like. And he's saying, for me to receive it and have it become part of me, I need to do it in an attitude of humility or meekness, which I, th I think is the same, uh, one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. So it can grow and be developed. But he doesn't leave it there. He he also says that with my attitude of humility, I am to receive the Logos like I'm grafting it into my life. So what does that look like? I had fun looking that up. I did look that up about grafting. Um, it's, it's not a word used in the New Testament a lot. You and I would know it more from maybe Romans 11 where Paul talks about the Jewish nation and Gentiles, and he uses the word grafted four times in that passage in Romans 11. But here, James is using the word and talking about being engrafted into, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, let me say it this way, having the word come and be engrafted into me. Now, if you look at anything on YouTube, it looks like, if I was um, the plant, it could be painful because the first thing they do is they pull out a knife. I need a branch from another 
fruit tree or something that I want to graft into. Uh, they call that a, a scion. We're going to get some really cool language here. I, I'm going to grab that branch that produces buds, and I'm going to take it off of this tree, and I'm going to cut it with a knife or pruning shears, and I'm going to add it to the stock, which is the thing that you want to add it to. So you take a knife, you cut a little sliver in it, and you cut off bark on the scion, the other branch that you're putting on, and you make it fit. You kind of like carve it out. Does that sound like a Bible verse? It says that you are my people and you are engraven on the palm of my hand. Sounds like John 15. I am the vine, you're the branches. You need to abide, dwell, live in and with me. So what he's doing is he's given us natural pictures of this process of being grafted into him. And this is the process that James is using to describe what I need to do with the Logos. So I need to receive the word that it might be grafted into me. So now he might be cutting things off of me, attitudes, thinking, uh, lies that I've believed about myself or others, that he is cutting away from me, sticking me on the stock, which is Jesus, the resurrected King and Lord, And he's then binding me with different material so that we go from being two to becoming one. And then what begins to happen over a period of time is that branch that's been grafted in begins to produce buds. And then now you've got what it is that you were looking for. Now here's an interesting thing with grafting is if it's like a fruit tree or a vine and you're taking that uh, scion and adding it to the stock, that the fruit that comes out of that new grafted situation, that, that two becoming one, is that when it produces seed, it doesn't reproduce the seed of what's been grafted together. It only produces seed of what it was. So you see what's going on is that when I got born again and Suzanne, who's born again, we get married, the two become one, we have offspring, my kids aren't automatically born again. They have to go through the process of being grafted in to the stock or the vine or In this case, we'll say Jesus. They have to be grafted in themselves. And the same process goes with them and their children. It's not passed down. So the fruit does not produce, the grafted fruit does not produce seed of its kind, which I think the parallel is like crazy is that you and I have to have our own personal relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's not enough for me to hear about how good God is. It's the invitation that I get to experience Him personally in my everyday life, in every situation that I'm in, with the people that I work with, with the people that I encounter at the grocery store, at the gas pump, let's say people out there saying things, doing things, all of that. You know, whoever Karen is, I get to represent the kingdom because I'm grafted into the greater one. And now I get to live that out. So now I'm, as I'm following James through here, I receive the word, the logos that's grafted into me, which is able to save my soul. It's not my spirit, man, so it's not touching the new birth but it's causing my soul, which we understand is our mind, will, and emotions. Paul mentions it in 1 Thessalonians 5, that he prays that you and I would be sanctified, set apart in our spirit, our soul, and our body. We are a triune being. And as much as we tried to separate some of that so that we understand it, we're still three parts that make one. So what I'm doing is I'm bringing in the Logos. 
I'm bringing in the word into my life that it would become grafted in, and then it sozos my soul. It brings, in fact, the word sozo, Strong's does okay, but, it, but if we understand how you use Strong's concordance, for those that maybe don't know, um, it's a gentleman named uh, Strong, <laughs> named after him, and he helped us to understand the Greek language by giving us like one word definitions, and oftentimes in Strong's it would be one to five words. What we really need, though, to go further in understanding was how was the word used in the day and age? How was it used with the people that wrote it, knew it, understood it in the culture that it was being written in versus today? So if I use the word bread, all of us would have different thoughts. When I grew up in the 70s out of high school, it was bread could be money. Got any bread on you? Well, yeah, I pull out a loaf of you know, white bread. No. They wanted to know how much cash I had on me. So sometimes when we read our Bibles, a lexicon is a little bit better. And one of the things with uh, Thayer's, if you have a phone, you can get Blue Letter Bible, BLB, free app, and you can go places you never thought, dreamed, or imagined. So Thayer's in there. It's part of the package. And he describes the word save or sozo to mean to save and transfer into. To transfer into. So I take the word and transfer it into my thinking so that it becomes a part of my thought life. So that when I see something in the word, I mentioned it earlier, it makes me think of other verses. It's this thread that runs through the scriptures. And hopefully it also causes us to see how different people used it throughout the whole context of all these different 35 to 40 authors that wrote the book, how they used it. What were they after? What were they trying to communicate? So in this case, James is saying we need to take the Logos, graft it into our lives, change the way we think so that it brings deliverance healing, wholeness to how I perceive and do life. But he says, then the danger is, verse 22, we pick it up where it says, you've got to be more than just a hearer of the word. You've got to be a doer of the word. So I think for a season, I was a really good hearer, not a very good applier. Didn't apply it to my life and then realize that this only works if I do it. It's kind of like I can acknowledge Suzanne with, babe, you're right with putting dirty dishes in the sink. I totally agree. I believe that to be true. <laughs> but you know and I know that's not going to be enough. <laughs> Otherwise, my life is going to change. <laughs> Come on. I need to be a doer of the word that I'm hearing from her. So it's the same way for you and I. We apply that word in our hearts and our lives, and then we start acting it out. And the invitation from God is, you can do it. You can, you can be an effectual doer and not one who is, as he says a little bit later, not merely a hearer who deludes. Doesn't mean delude like water down like you and I would think. It actually means that we are deceived or we circumvent. We go around. We, I, I like easy. I really do. That's why I've never learned to type. Easy. This is easy. Dun, dun, dun. It's not effective, though. And it's not very proficient. So I've circumvented by having my wife do most of my typing. Up until... About five years ago, we went back to Bible school, and she says, I'm not doing your papers anymore. You're on your own, big boy. <laughs> what? I tried to give her a verse. <laughs> yeah, okay, you guys already know how that worked out. <laughs> Oftentimes, she would push back, but now she just looks at me and just keeps moving. Yeah, you have no power over me. 
and I'm not doing that. But I did find, this is definitely a rabbit trail, but I found on, uh, what is it, Word? And also now Google has a dictation. I can use a microphone, click that little puppy, and start talking, and it writes everything down. I say, okay, then I have to say period, and it puts a period. When it first starts doing it, it puts period, P-E-R-I-O-D. <laughs> it's like, no, no. Anyway, so I cheated through first and second year at school and writing my papers because I found a program that would take my voice. Well, I don't think it's cheating, but anyway. I could, I could easily come up with 1,500 words with no problem and not repeat the same sentence over and over again like I did in high school. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm touching hearts right now, touching hearts. Yeah, or what English teacher, yeah, you got to have so many words, yeah. How many ways can I say that sentence? Anyway, coming back, off the rabbit trail. So now he's, James is going, okay, you, we need to be an effectual doer of the word and not merely a hearer so that we're not deceiving ourselves into believing something else is going on. And then he gives us a natural example. It'd be like you looking in the mirror. I would venture to guess most of us used a mirror today on some level. Like when you woke up, walked into the bathroom, there was a mirror somewhere in there that was saying something to you about your current state. It could be hair. It could be, I need to brush my teeth. What is that hanging out my tooth? <laughs> yeah, I had some you know, what would you call it? Uh, I was going to say seaweed, but um, but it's that stuff that you eat that's raw. That's it. That was the word, sushi. Yeah, because they wrap it in seaweed and it's still in your teeth because you missed it last night when you brushed your teeth in the dark. But anyway, <laughs> so the, word, the mirror didn't work. Uh, anyway, James is using a mirror to say it's like you as a natural man or woman, you walk over, you look in the mirror that is set up to, let's say, expose weaknesses, shortcomings, things that are out of place. Guys are known to just look in the mirror because they think they're really awesome and they're not looking to change anything. There, are, there is that. Oftentimes, though, the word is... or. The, the mirror is set up to show us something about ourselves. So he's using that in James to say, okay, you're like a man that looks at your face, natural face in a mirror, but once you looked at yourself and you go away, immediately you've forgotten what kind of person you are. So that's why I need the Logos to be engrafted into my life so that when my quiet time or my time with the Lord or let's just say I'm busy in life. I'm not even intentional with being uh, paying attention. Lord, are you saying something here? But in the middle of something, he actually whispers something to me. That is me looking back at the mirror. It's with intentionality that I'm going, What? You're in this situation when it looks impossible. In fact, let me encourage you, the more impossible the situation looks, the more your father goes, I really am attracted to this situation. Because when they say it can't be done, guess who shows up? Papa God shows up and says, oh, yeah, no sweat. So he who raises the dead can change circumstances. He can make things happen. All kinds of wild and crazy things. God's just looking for somebody to simply look at the mirror and remember who they are. So we're not doing this on our own. We're doing this with him who is the giver of life. He's good and he's good all the time. So if it's not good, it's not God and it's not over. Add that little caveat. If it's not good, then it's not over. Because I'm looking for the good in this situation, and I refuse 
to close a door or believe anything less than that. In fact, what the Logos does for me is it reminds me of, is this a lie or is this the truth? Because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and if you're born again, so are you. You can't get any more right with him. So let me sum up that with looking at the Logos. You're invited to have that Logos change your life, reshape your thinking to think like the kingdom of heaven, look for opportunities for him and for the rhema voice of God, the living voice to come and say, this is what you need to do. And usually it'll be something that will stretch you, cause you a little bit of concernment and go, oh, I can't do that. On the other side of I can't do that is yes, Lord, and then we see a miracle. We see things happen and we become transformed, looking more and more like him in our lives. Amen. That is the message for this morning. Now, I'm not done, though. Going back to on a scale of 1 to 10, those of you that had pain, anywhere on that 1 to 10 scale at the start of the service, my question is, is it different now than it was at the start of the service? Yes? Give me an example. What did you have before? Neck, yes, Bob, and, he, and it's gone, yeah, praise God, no neck pain. That's a good word, eh, George? Three or four, okay. So I think if we went around the room, we could have everybody say on some level it's changed. Has anybody had it go from a five to a seven, go the other way? Has the pain gotten worse for anybody? Okay, there's one. All right, that's okay. Not, it's not okay. Let me rephrase that. Yeah, it's, I, I understand. But I, I thank you for being honest. Because what we're going to do now is, uh, why don't we stand up? You guys have been sitting maybe for a while, get some circulation back in your legs. I'm not going to keep you standing very long. Part of, I'm going to say the end result of my message is you have authority in your life and over your life. So with my sister who's had pain go up, others that it's gone down, we're going to address the pain in our body. We're going to speak to it. Mark 11 says, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, cast in the sea, doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says shall come to pass, he can have what he says. That's a principle that we get to talk to things. Your body responds to your voice more than anybody else's voice. And it really feels awkward at first. But, the result is, is that if I have pain, then I get to talk to my body, and I talk to pain and tell it to leave. But we don't want to stop with just telling pain to leave, because pain is an indicator that something isn't working, or it's out of place. So, once I discover in the pain, I speak to it, when it leaves, I also say, and the root of whatever the source of the pain is, you are also commanded in Jesus' name to leave. Because he's given us a name above every name, right? It has to leave. It has to leave. Some, it will be instantaneous. Some, it'll be progressive. But it's still healing, and it's what Jesus paid for. So I'm going to ask you to take about 15 seconds. We're not going to pray around the world. And for everybody that we're sitting around, you're going to pay, pray for you. You're going to talk to your pain. You don't have to yell. Matthew 28 says, all authority has been given unto me, heaven and earth. Now, go make disciples. So the implication is you and I have authority over our own bodies. And if it's something that I've caused, then maybe I need to repent for that. But no, 
Actually, I don't feel like the Lord's saying to do that. I feel like this is a, a, a grace and mercy extension of just talk to your body. And whatever you did is already under the blood. He's already forgiven it. And if you need to address it later because he talks to you about it, then amen. Okay, 15 seconds. Talk to your body. Wherever it's at, you address it. You talk to it like it's something, you know, all right, pain in my ankle. And I don't have pain in my ankle, but if I did, I address my ankle. In Jesus' name, I tell you to straighten up. You work right. I might even check it. And Lord, whatever the source of it is, I declare healing over it in Jesus' name. That might have been under 15 seconds. We need to practice doing this for us so that it becomes very simple for us to do it for others. The hardest person in the room to minister to is yourself, isn't it? Oh, yeah, let me pray for you. I'm in. But then, oh, me? Okay. Anyway, I'm talking too long. Go ahead and pray. I'll give you 15 seconds. I'm going to stand up here and be quiet. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then you just add the amen. Amen. Okay. Have a seat real quick. Yeah, you thought you were leaving. Nope. <laughs> but I am done. I, I felt like I, I had this highlighted to me, which was, I asked the Lord for a word of knowledge. Just tell me what's going on. How can we pray for people or something that, to that effect? And if anybody in here is dealing with an L5, L6, that was the specific word that I heard. I had to look it up. I mean, I knew it was probably something vertebrae in the back and so forth and so on and discovered that L5 is down on the tailbone and some people have a 6 and some people don't. So L5, L6. Yeah, would you stand? If that's you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I love it. Come on. Yeah, yeah, four or five. That's okay. It's in that group of five, six, so we'll take a four as well. All right, I'm going to pray a real simple prayer. Because he highlighted it, I believe he wants to take care of it. And if you can't stand, it's okay too. It doesn't disqualify anybody. So, Father, I thank you that you are concerned enough from heaven to highlight that and say to me, say something about it because I want to heal it. So, Father, I thank you right now for the balm of Gilead who has come and is here present to heal right now. So we speak to L4s, L5s, L6s. And, Lord, if there's anybody else with an L anywhere in their body going on that's out of alignment, we speak life, healing, and wholeness in Jesus' name. And, Lord, the root of whatever it is, whether it was an accident in a car or something happened at birth or just recently, I thank you that all of it is covered in this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, part of the test is doing something that you couldn't do before. So it's attempting, attempting to do something. If it's touching your toes, you can do it whenever but I don't want to re be remiss on there's something required of us in our believing and receiving that I need to do. As I've heard one brother say, after the first three times, the first time he says, I, I can't do that. Well, then it won't work. <laughs> so we have to change our vocabulary. I'm receiving the engrafted word. It's transforming how I think. So I'm going to act on a word that's been given to me and I'll try. No, don't try. Do it. Just do it. See what he does. And after the third time, this individual is saying, this is all I can do. Hey, you're, you're on your way. After that, I can't do it because I can't touch my toes. But anyway, got down touched his toes on the third try. Whoops. On the third try. 
So that's the part that I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I know that he partners with us, and he's requiring us to step out with him. Amen. Thanks so much. You guys have been so awesome. I feel like I'm at my house with all my friends. Yeah. Praise God. Mm. You guys. Uh, prayer, prayer team. Prayer team. Prayer team. Yes. If you're on the prayer team, come on up. So you're going to pray for people? Yeah, we're going to pray for people still. Maybe something else going on. You need agreement. <laughs>